Hello, my name is Oak Metcalf, and I'm the state materials engineer for the Montana Department of Transportation. And today I'm going to talk to you about something that has been complicated, confusing, and just downright aggravating over the years, and that's Buy America. You'll notice that I put Buy America in quotation marks, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. But my goal over the next 45 minutes or so is to explain this regulation and take some of the mystery out of what it means, why it's required, and how to deal with it. I'd also like to take this time to thank the auditors and the Materials Information and Certification Office for their assistance putting this together. I built this presentation on several other presentations that Miko has put together over the years. With very rare exceptions, the Buy America rules apply to all MDT projects. It all started back in 1982 with the Surface Transportation Assistance Act. This act laid the groundwork for Buy America by requiring all federal aid projects to use steel and iron that was domestically manufactured. This is where the first misconception about Buy America comes from. There is no such thing as the Buy America Act. Buy America was just a provision contained within the Surface Transportation Assistance Act, Section 165 to be exact. From that act, the STAA, Title 23, Section 313 of the United States Code was amended to require that all steel and iron be domestic for any project that was federal aid eligible under the National Environmental Policy Act. In other words, a project that has a NEPA document. So that would be a categorical exclusion, an environmental assessment, or an environmental impact statement. This means pretty much all MDT construction projects. However, maintenance and state funded projects without a NEPA document are exempt. Further complicating things, since the STAA covered all federal aid projects, which includes the FAA, the FTA, the FRA, and Amtrak, as well as FHWA, the result was five different definitions of Buy America. This is why stating something meets Buy America, quote unquote, doesn't really mean anything unless you follow it up with additional clarifying language. So the rules are further defined and clarified for FHWA in Title 23, Section 635.410 of the Code of Federal Regulations. This is where we get the operating definition that you'll see throughout this presentation, and that's that iron and steel must come from manufacturing processes, including coatings, that occur entirely within the United States of America. If you ever want to learn more, FHWA has summarized all this on their website that you can find at this link. This is where MDT goes for guidance and interpretation. Finally, the rules are incorporated into MDT contracts via the spec book and standard specification 10609. Now, having said all that, a minimal or minimum amount of foreign steel may be used. This is referred to as the minimal use clause. If the total dollar amount of the foreign steel, including delivery to the project, but not including labor, is less than either $2,500 or one-tenth of 1% 1 of the total contract value, whichever is more, then foreign steel is allowed. So where does this leave us? Whenever federal aid is involved in a project, the rules apply, and it starts with pre-construction. If any federal aid dollars are spent in design, but for some reason the project is state funded during construction, the rules still apply. If there is any steel on a maintenance project that uses federal funds, the rules apply. Before we go too much further, it's important to note what rules we're talking about and that they apply to steel that is permanently incorporated into the project. If a steel item is only temporary, like shoring, and will be removed later, then the rules don't apply to that item. Therefore, if MDT allows foreign steel to be permanently installed and the cost is in excess of the minimal use amount we just went over, that steel must be removed and replaced with domestic steel at contractor expense. If MDT were to decide to leave foreign steel in place for whatever reason, knowing it was non-domestic, the most likely outcome is the entire project would be non-parred 
meaning FHWA would not participate in the project at all, which means MDT would have to pay for it with 100% state funds. And I'm here to tell you, we can't afford that. Technically, there's a chance FHWA would non-par a single item. However, because MDT has been warned by FHWA repeatedly to ensure this doesn't happen due to our past transgressions, it is highly unlikely only the item would be non-parred. That is why we place such scrutiny on this topic. So, just what is domestic steel then? The term melted and manufactured in the USA is generally acceptable language for certifications indicating the steel and iron were just that, melted and manufactured domestically. Melted means the liquid metal originated in the United States. The ore can be foreign, but the act of melting, forging, casting, etc., has to take place domestically. Ingots or billets from other countries are not allowed. Manufactured means pretty much what you think it means, anything that affects the final form or chemical content of the steel or iron. We'll talk a lot later about fabrication, but this is just another term for manufacturing. Now, what does this mean for our field staff and the contractors and suppliers? This is where FHWA worked in conjunction with the local FHWA division office here in Montana to figure out how to enforce the rules. Ever since MDT went to using Site Manager and the Astroware programs for contract administration and materials lab information, we have identified materials using nine digit material codes that correspond to the section of the spec book that deals with them. This isn't an absolute because there are always materials that are dealt with in the special provisions or don't have a specific section of their own in the spec book, but it's true in the majority of cases. These codes are itemized with their respective sampling and testing requirements in the materials manual, specifically in section MT601. Once all the standard materials were given codes, those codes were then placed into what we call Buy America categories. Category one requires the highest level of documentation. Heat numbers from mill certs or MTRs are used to trace and track the steel back to the original mill where it was melted. The heat numbers are also used to trace and track the steel through the fabrication process to ensure the steel that ends up in the final product is the same steel that left the mill. This is also known as the step process where each entity responsible for manufacturing or fabrication certifies their step. This includes coatings, which would be galvanizing or epoxy coating or powder coating. They have to certify that their step happened into the United States and all of the fabrication has to happen in the United States and all the steel used has to happen in the United States. This is all traced and tracked with the heat number back to the original mill. Currently, there are only seven material codes that are considered category one. Those are box beam guardrail, W beam guardrail, structural piling, pipe piling, and sheet piling, structural steel tubing, and structural steel plate. Category two only requires certification from the final step or the final fabricator in the process. Mill certs are not required to be submitted to MDT, but the final fabricator must certify the product they deliver was manufactured domestically using domestic steel, and they must maintain all documentation to prove domestic origin of the steel. So MDT doesn't need the mill certs, but the manufacturer needs to maintain the mill certs in their files. Here now are some examples of language that is acceptable to certify all that we've discussed so far. Melted and manufactured in the USA is still the standard. A cert could also say meets 23 CFR 635.410. This addresses what we discussed previously about the five different definitions of Buy America. And finally, the language from the code verbatim from section 635.410 of 23 CFR, all manufacturing processes, including coatings, have occurred in the United States. Just saying by America doesn't work because all those alternate definitions I've been referring to allow for higher amounts of foreign steel than is allowed by 23 CFR. 
Made in America doesn't work either because that usually means something was assembled in America with no regard to the source of the raw materials. This is also known sometimes as by American with an N, which is another law altogether. This causes confusion because by American applies to direct federal spending while by America applies to federal aid spending. This is an important distinction for contractors and suppliers. To further specify, MDT is a state DOT and therefore we use federal aid dollars. But Western federal lands who oversees Yellowstone National Park or Glacier National Park, they use direct federal dollars. Now that we've gone over the what and the why, here's the how. When it comes to administering MDT contracts, it starts with the schedule of values. Most are familiar with the list of line numbers and bid items that contractors provide unit prices for in the project proposal. Each nine digit bid item is set up in AshToWare with the relevant materials associated to it. This association includes acceptance methods, the number and frequency of samples and tests, the sample and test responsibilities, and most important for this discussion, which Buy America category a steel or iron material is in. At this point, I wanna address uncategorized materials. Many of you remember the off the shelf rule or the less than 90% rule that made these items exempt. Well, that rule was struck down by a federal judge back in December of 2015. Ever since then, there are no exemptions to the law. All steel and iron must comply. However, recognizing that documentation might not exist for some of these items, even though they do contain 100% domestic material, if a material is uncategorized, meaning the material code is neither category one nor category two, documentation is not required to be submitted unless it is specifically requested. The law still applies in these cases, but MDT's level of documentation is lesser. So make sure to read and understand section MT601 in the materials manual and the material codes it contains. In a few moments, I'll show you a new report we've come up with that summarizes all this information so it's at your fingertips. Now that we know the bid item, the material code, and the steel category, the next step is to enter the required information on the Form 406. The prime contractor must submit the Form 406 to MDT, which includes their overall certification that all steel and iron materials meet these domestic origin rules. And we'll go through the Form 406 in a moment as well. Something else to think about, Today, we're focusing on domestic steel requirements. That means that the steel originated in the United States. But it's important to remember that these items must also meet the design and quality requirements of the contract. Sometimes the steel documentation covers both these requirements, but sometimes it does not. So it's important to remember there are two separate requirements and both must be satisfied. So I've mentioned the materials manual a few times, and now here's an example of what it looks like and the information it contains. You can access the manual at this link right here. This takes you to the external MDT webpage. And you can also find all the previous versions of materials manuals at that link. Remember, the version in play at the time of letting sets the rules, but also remember, if a standard is lesser today, then at the time of letting, the lesser standard is acceptable. And on the flip side, if a standard is higher today than at the time of letting, the standard at the time of letting is still acceptable because that's what the contractor bid on. So that's a best of both worlds kind of situation. So here we have an example of the two steel categories. In each example, you can see the material description. So box beam guardrail or steel guardrail posts and the corresponding nine digit material code. So for this first one, we have 705010102. And below we have 704010401. This indicates section 705 of the spec book. This indicates 704, section 704 of the spec book. 
Um, the material acceptance requirement is in the row above here in white, and the steel requirement is in the row below here in gray. It shows you the steel category, one or two. And then as I mentioned before, we also have the testing and acceptance requirements here. So if there were other tests involved, they would be shown in this column here. Um, the sample rates and frequencies are here. The sample size is here. And then the responsibility for collecting paperwork or performing tests are outlined here between the field, the district, and the headquarters lab. So in this case, since we don't take a sample of the box bean, there, there's no sample size or tests. And we're just saying that you need to get one data sheet per each item. And you have to do a visual inspection and ensure that the certification meets all the requirements. Then all the way over here at the right, we have a little section for notes and special instructions. Now here we have an example of the new steel checklist. This report should be generated by the MDT field crew at the beginning of each project and provided to the prime contractor at the pre-construction conference. It summarizes the bid items that have category one or category two steel materials associated to them. It also contains all the project information. So up here we have contract and project information. Uh, this is an internal universal project number. And then here we have the project description. This example shows two tied projects on the same contract. Uh, something else to think about or to remember, I should say, steel documents don't need to be submitted twice, once for each project. So here we have the two projects on the same contract. The documentation only needs to be submitted once for each material on each item, as long as the documentation covers the total amount of material paid for. So now we'll go through this here a little bit, give you a little bit more explanation. So we start off at the left side of the page with the bid item and description. So in this case, we're talking about 606-010-040 guardrail steel box beam. And so you'll see that that is repeated four times here. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail, but remember we have two projects. So I'll get to that. Then here in the middle, we have the material codes. So here we've got 705010102 box beam guardrail. This is what we just showed you in the materials manual. And then finally, on the right side, we have the steel category. And again, box beam guardrail is category one. So like I was saying, this gives you all of the tied project information. So because we have two projects on the same contract, that's why we have the highlights here in yellow and green. So the yellow and green separate which project we're talking about. Then when we look at the material codes, we have the blue and the purple highlights. This separates different materials. So in this situation, we have two projects. Each project has the steel box beam guardrail bid item on it. And for that bid item, we have box beam guardrail and steel guardrail posts, steel guardrail posts. So it looks like it's in here twice because that's once for each project. But again, you only have to submit the documentation one time for each material that's on each bid item for the contract, as long as the quantity covers the entire quantity paid for on the contract. So now here's a new version of the Form 406. It's simpler and easier to get more items on a single sheet of paper, but requires basically the same information as before with a few updates to the form. This form shows how MDT shares the risk with the contractor as far as the accuracy of the documentation that is provided. That's why the prime contractor must sign. Remember, MDT's agreement is with the prime contractor not with the subcontractor or the supplier or the distributor or the mill or the foundry or whatever. Uh, 
Ultimately, the prime contractor is responsible for the information provided on this form and the materials furnished. One change you might notice from older forms is there's a line for the final fabricator for each bid item and material. So that's up here, we added a third line. So now it says heat number, mill, and final fabricator. That's a, that's a change and we'll explain that a little bit later. Previously, the final fabricator information was all documented on the top of the form, which limited the number of suppliers and fabricators on each form to only one. This form also takes advantage of some other traceability changes that I'll get to later, but the intent is to give you the ability to include multiple fabricators on one sheet of paper. Something else to think about in this case, Regarding this form, sometimes the mill is also the final fabricator. Sheet pile is a good example of this. As in many cases, the sheet pile leaves the mill in its final shape. So the mill is both the mill and the final fabricator. Now here's a closer look at the form and we'll go through how to fill it out. Of course, at the top, we have the standard information. So we're looking for project information, but this is a change. We want to know the contract number now, not the project number now. So remember before when I was telling you that we have tied projects, but we only are interested in the total quantity for the contract. That's why we're asking for the contract now. And then the project name, of course, that's pretty standard. Below that is the statement that the prime contractor is making to MDT regarding these materials. This is another update. There's been some confusion in the past about who's making what statement to who, but as I said, this form is from the prime contractor to MDT, so this is a statement that the prime contractor is making to us. So it says the materials listed herein furnished to MDT for the use in the construction of the above reference project by the prime contractor have originated and or been fabricated at the mills and fabricators indicated below. So that's a, that's a minor change, but significant. Now we'll go through some examples uh, for each category. So starting off with category one, the first thing we have on the left is the bid item. So that's pretty standard. Then we have the material code, and that's what we've just gone over from the materials manual. And there's room underneath where the material code is so that you can enter the material description if that provides clarification. This is a fill-in form, by the way, online. So whatever you type into these squares, it automatically sizes. Then we have the quantity and the unit of measure. And then all the way over at the right, that's where the category goes. Now, getting to the new stuff, you know, previously we had the, the heat number here and then the mill. And now we have a line for the final fabricator. So for this category one example, all of the relevant information is right there on one line, heat number, mill, and final fabricator. So now looking at a category two example, we have mostly the same stuff. It starts off with the bid item, then the material code, then the quantity, then the unit of measure, then the category. But in this case, since it's category two, all we need is the final fabricator. Uh, a couple of other points to think about here when we talk about quantity, the quantity must represent at least the amount installed, not necessarily the exact amount or plan quantity. Also, the total doesn't have to be all on one form. Multiple forms may be submitted, but the total amount, the sum total amount indicated on the total number of forms must cover the total amount installed. The easiest way to look at this is to think of a delivery. When a delivery shows up, the paperwork must represent the amount delivered. But if more material is needed, as is often the case, then paperwork representing the amount delivered should be submitted at that time. And then there's no need to go back and change the original Form 406 and only submit one. You just submit both forms and then the cumulative total has to cover the amount that's installed. 
I alluded to this point before, but note that distributors and suppliers are left out of this. And that's on purpose. And I'll get to that in just a moment. So now here are the updated instructions, and I'll just go through these highlighted areas a bit to kind of uh, focus on some of the changes. What's been highlighted and what's in red is new or is drawing the reader's attention to it. So first up here, we have the standard language. One copy of the certificate needs to be submitted to the project manager. Uh, the prime contractor is responsible for providing the proper documentation. We went over that. Um, here is just a reference to the Montana standard specification, the United States Code, and the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, here's the discussion about the language and how just meets by America isn't sufficient. And then we have examples of what is acceptable, melted and manufactured in the United States, complies with 23 CFR, all manufacturing processes, including application of coding, have occurred in the United States. And then below that, we have a discussion about category one, uh, making sure that we're tracing the heat numbers from the mill through the final fabrication. And each fabrication uh, step is certifying their process, including the coatings. Then we have a discussion on category two, um, and it talks about how heat numbers are not required to be submitted, but that the final fabricator must maintain all the original documentation. And then something worth noting here about coatings, this comes up every now and again. So coating is considered fabrication, but oftentimes the coder is the last process that happens, even though the item isn't shipped to the project from the coder. So what happens is a steel fabricator makes a railing or something and then sends it out to get galvanized. And then the galvanizer sends it back to who he got it from, and then that fabricator delivers it to the project. So the coding is technically the last thing that happened, but the coder has no idea what the steel, where, or excuse me, the coder has no idea where the steel came from in the item that they coded. They just coded the thing that was sent to them. So they can provide certification that says, yes, I coded this thing in Walla Walla, Washington, and then they send that back to the fabricator. But the point I'm getting at here is all of that information must get to the project so that we know that it was coded in the United States. So the, whoever the fabricator is in this case would be responsible for collecting that information from the coder and then providing it to MDT. This highlighted in red language here is a discussion about quantity because this comes up a lot. And so, like I was saying, the total amount of steel and iron incorporated into the project must be covered by one or more Form 406, Form 406s. Multiple forms can be submitted, and the total quantity indicated must equal at least the quantity of that item permanently incorporated into the project. So if you run over a little bit, that's fine, but it has to cover the amount that's been permanently incorporated into the project. And this little underline here, this also includes iron materials, steel and iron materials that are incidental to the bid item. So that's why we're giving you the material code because things like rebar, for instance, are often included in another bid item, but you still have to provide documentation for the rebar. And then finally, just to reiterate again, this form has to be signed by the prime contractor. Now for all you Marvel fans out here, are out there. This is my stupid little nerdy joke. Uh, if you saw Dr. Strange, I put the instructions in the front of the form where previously they were in the back of the form. And if you saw that movie, you know what I'm talking about. But now the instructions are up front, not behind. So you read them first when you download the form. Okay, now we're going to go over some examples. And here we have kind of a visual flow in general of category one. Uh, this is where things are a bit different from what we've taught or instructed before. Some of these slides were used in the presentation at the 2020 MDT construction conference. So I'm using these same slides with X's and red ink and strikeouts to show where things have changed. So first we start at the mill 
We always start at the mill for category one with the heat number and certification. That heat number must be traceable through any intermediate fabrication or distribution before the final fabricator. So if a coil leaves the mill, goes to a supply house, and then goes to a rolling mill, we must be able to follow that heat number out of the mill and into the rolling mill. So there we go. Each step then certifies their work took place in the US using domestic steel, and it's traced with the heat number. Now here's what's different. Once the product is finally fabricated, we don't need to trace the steps between the final fabricator and the project. So previously we were tracking all of that stuff through distributors and subcontractors and all that other kind of stuff. Well, we're not doing that anymore. We're, we're leapfrogging that step. Um, so we just need to trace the material or excuse me, we just need to trace the heat numbers from the steel mill to the final fabricator. And then finally, the heat number, mill, and final fabricator are all shown on the Form 406, and all of the step documentation is attached to that form, and that's submitted to MDT. So now we have a specific example, and here's just a visual representation of the flow. We're going to look at some guardrail. And so here we have a guardrail mill test with the heat number. We know who the final fabricator is. And then we'll have an example of the form 406. So working backwards from the job site or starting at the form 406, and this example is the old form because the new form hasn't been out there very long. Um, we're going to start with all of this information. So we have the heat number here, in this case, 240943. Uh, we know who the fabricator is. In this case, it's shown as the furnisher. And this is the stuff that we're getting rid of that we're cleaning up up here. But Universal Industrial Sales is the fabricator. In this example, Mount West Holding Company is a subcontractor. And then Missouri River Contractors, they're the prime. Uh, but we have all the information that we need. So we have the heat number, the mill, the fabricator, the prime contractor, and the signature. And now we have the fabricator's certification, the final fabricator, excuse me, the final fabricator certification. Universal Industrial Sales is the guardrail manufacturer, and they take the coil from the mill and then they make the W shapes or the box beam shapes. In this case, we're focusing on uh, W beam guardrail, this particular one right here. Um, they have provided all sorts of good information on this cert. It's very helpful, and previously it was required, but it's no longer required. Now, this information would still be helpful, and MDT is not going to say try again or return these documents and say start over, but we're just not gonna require it moving forward. Uh, believe it or not, we are trying to cut down on paperwork. Um, I know it doesn't seem that way, but we are trying. So focusing on what is required moving forward, the final fabricator provides a statement that the fabrication was done in the US, including galvanization, and that it meets all the specifications and what materials or items the CERT covers. So here's a list of all the materials that it covers. And then down here, we have a list or this, this language down here uh, gives us everything that we need. You'll note, if you look, it says meets by America, but it also says meets 23 CFR 635-410, and it says melted and manufactured in the U.S. So they've really covered all their bases. In addition, it tells us that it was galvanized here in the United States, and it meets the specifications it meets ASHTO M180 for guardrail. It meets ASHTO, excuse me, it meets ASHTO M270 for structural steel. This is A307 here is for uh, steel cable. So we've got all the information that we need, including the name of the person from the company. Um, so this is a great example of a certification. Now you might think that we're missing something, um, but when we look at the second page, Here's where we have the heat number. So here's the heat number that we started off with, 240943. Now here's the mill cert. 
showing the heat number and indicating the heat number was sold to universal industrial sales. So we have this heat number traced all the way from the beginning or the end, depending on how you look at it, from the mill to the form 406. So we've got heat number 240943 sold to universal industrial sales. So this is a really good example of all of the required documentation. Now, what I've done here is taken this example and put it into the new form 406 to kind of highlight the differences. This is a mocked up example. It contains all the same information, the item number, the quantity, the category, steel category, but it now shows the material code that is attached to the item number, making the exact tie back to the materials manual and by reference, the contract. So that's what all this stuff is now. We have the nine digit material codes. The heat number, mill, and final fabricator are all shown on the same row as the bid item for the metal beam guardrail. So in this example, we're looking at the bottom row here. So we got W beam, and here's that same heat number we were looking at before, 240943. It also shows the prime contractor and doesn't deal with subcontractors or suppliers or distributors. So again, the form 406 is from the prime to MDT. So we're cleaning up all that confusion about subcontractors or furnishers or whatever. We just want to know who fabricated it, who the final fabricator was, and who the prime contractor is, along with the mill and the heat number if it's category one. So for the contracting community, it's up to you if you want your subs to fill this out. But the prime must still sign and indicate that you have provided this material to MDT. MDT is paying the prime for this item, not the sub or the supplier. And then all this here on the second column is from the second page of the Form 406. And this will come into play in the next couple of slides. But this basically indicates that we have a two-page Form 406. So now here's the same example, but using a new material code for W-beam terminal sections. Now, we didn't talk about the terminal sections before, but I'm using this as an example to highlight the change. So if you notice uh, on the second column there, this is the previous slide where we have the 70501-0501 at the bottom. And now here's the new slide where that line is gone. So what we've done is create a new category two material code for W beam terminal sections as a unit. Previously, we treated terminal sections as a combination of W beam guardrail and guardrail posts. So that's the previous with the W beam being category one and the post being category two. So here we have category one W beam, category two guardrail posts. Moving forward, we have a single code, a single category two code for the entire W beam terminal section. So now we don't need heat numbers like we did previously in this situation. Um, yeah, so sorry, lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, we have the category two requirement and that covers the entire terminal section unit. Now all that's required is the certification from the fabricator indicating that the terminal section was manufactured and coded in the United States using steel melted and manufactured in the US, all that stuff that we've been beating into your head so far. So you know, the intent of this or the point of this discussion is we eliminated a material code and we eliminated a line on the form 406. Now taking one step further, I'm proposing a new change and that's what's represented here in blue. And this has to do with one-way departure sections. So notice here, we have one line for one-way departure sections. And if we go back, I went back too many times. Here we have three lines for one-way departure sections. So we have the W-beam, the flare, and the post. But moving forward, I'm proposing that Doing, I'm proposing that we do what we did with the W beam terminal section and create a single new code for the departure section. Following the same logic, departure sections 
don't have quite as many parts as a terminal section, but they are a unit and can be sold as a unit. And they include cable and brackets, the flared section, and then a piece of WB. This isn't in place yet, but if and when it is approved by FHWA, a new material code will be added to MT601 and associated with the departure section bid item. That's why this is just XXXXX here, because it's this is still proposed. Um, assuming all this is approved, then the same example that we started with that was on two pages now fits on a single page form 406. So that brings category one to a close, and we'll move on to category two here in a second. Um, but I wanted to take a moment to talk about fabrication. I mentioned this at the beginning. Now, this list here is a reminder of what we discussed as far as fabrication processes are, processes are concerned. So all these bullet points, cutting, bending, rolling, welding, they're considered fabrication. Once one of these actions is performed, the entity who performed it becomes a fabricator, and that action must take place in the U.S. As an example, I was reviewing a mill cert the other day that said some pipe was made in Canada, but finished in the U.S., so since it was partially made in Canada, that pipe does not meet Title 23 by America. It may meet other definitions of the law, but it doesn't meet Title 23, which is what we follow for federal aid highway projects. This is why language is very important. For another example, we had a project where some pipe piles were used or were installed, and they were manufactured from steel coil that came from an American mill that was rolled and welded into a pipe pile in an American pipe shop. Then they were sold to a distributor in Canada. And then they bounced around Canada for a while. Then they re-entered the United States and then they were installed on the project. But because no fabrication happened in the United, or excuse me, but because no fabrication happened in Canada, it all happened inside the United States, then they were by America compliant. So keep that in mind as we move on to category two. So here we have the same style of example. This is the flow of category two documentation using X's and strikeouts to highlight the differences from the 2020 presentation at the MDT construction conference. And since this is a category two item, we don't need to start at the mill. We don't need the mill certs. We just need the final fabricator. We don't need to worry about distributors and we need the form 406 with the final fabricator's name and the prime contractor's signature. And again, here's just a visual representation of the example that we're going to talk about. This is going to be a breakaway device for a signpost. So we have the final fabricator information. We don't need to worry about the distributor. And then we have the 406. So here's the example, same example that we used before, just like we did with category one. And moving backwards from the form 406, the fabricator is shown. We happen to know that the fabricator is transpo. And we have the right um, material here. These represent the break safe uh, signpost breakaways. And then we have the bid item. And again, this stuff up here, corral sales, they're the, distrib they're the distributor. Mountain West is the subcontractor and then Schillinger is the prime. But again, we don't need to worry about this stuff. Here's the signature. So we have a good example of category two. Now, like I was saying, this whole step here isn't required anymore. Previously, we traced all this stuff, but we don't need to because Corral Sales didn't do any fabrication. As long as we know who the final fabricator is, that's the important part. So this can still be provided, but it's not required. And now we have the cert from Transpo. They're the fabricator. And in here, they tell us that they fabricated everything in the United States using steel that was melted and manufactured in the United States. And they even say, go, excuse me, they even go so far as to say that we have all of the documentation stored at our facility. They tell us what the cert is for. So here's the break safe up here. And so in this case, this works as not only the steel documentation, but the material documentation because break safe devices or breakaway devices are required to be listed on the QPL. So we can take this and verify that this item was listed on the QPL. So that's the good category two example. 
And it also highlights how we're trying to eliminate some unnecessary paperwork. Now that we've gone through the basic information as far as Buy America is concerned and a couple of examples, we're going to go through some special situations now. Um, before we move on, I want to talk about waivers. I forgot to mention this before. FHWA may grant a waiver if there isn't a domestic source of a certain material. However, in reality, waivers are very complicated and basically impossible to get within the time frame of a project. So it's not technically impossible to get a waiver from FHWA, but those come directly from, a, from headquarters in Washington, D.C. and require comment periods, research, and a lot of work. Therefore, if a project has been advertised, there's no real chance of getting a waiver. I just wanted to address that since that question comes up often. So, like I said, we've covered the standard practice for steel and iron items. We've gone over some examples, but now let's talk about some special situations that we have additional guidance and procedures for. So the first one we wanna talk about is prefabricated steel items. As you can imagine, all the paperwork involved in keeping track of all this stuff can build up, especially for a steel bridge or structure. Also, because all steel and iron is included, it becomes difficult to keep track of small bits and pieces that go into things like diaphragms and cross braces and are still required to be domestic. It's hard to track that stuff on a project, you know, getting all that paperwork from the shop to the project. After spending years trying to sort through all this stuff, literally reams and reams of paper on previous projects, and that takes a considerable number of man hours, both for the contractor and for MDT. MDT worked with FHWA Montana Division to come up with an alternative. The result was a spec change in the summer of 2017 that allowed items that are prefabricated or fabricated away from the project site to be accepted with a letter from the prefabricator, equivalent to Category 2 level documentation. Unfortunately, the spec language omitted a key component of why FHWA allowed these prefabricated items to be accepted as a Category 2, and that's pre-inspection. The intent of the spec change was to address the paperwork hassle of these large bridges and structures that MDT was already inspecting at the point of fabrication. Part of pre-inspection is a review and verification of document tracking, that's required by the third party certification or audits that are also required of those prefabrication shops and MDT standard specifications. So that would be AISC, PCI, or NPCA for steel structures or pre stressed items or pre cast items. Since the spec wasn't specific enough, MDT had to accept any prefabricated item on that basis contractually, even if it wasn't pre inspected or came from a certified shop. In essence, these prefabricated products contain what would be considered category one materials separately. And even though the third party certification assured documentation was being traced and tracked, those certifications have no assurance that the steel is domestic. It only means that the shop can tell you where they got their steel from and what steel is in what item. It doesn't have to be domestic. The combination of the third party certification and MDT's pre-inspection is what makes it acceptable to FHWA. Without both, excuse me, without both those aspects, FHWA will no longer allow this level of acceptance. Therefore, a spec revision is working its way through the process to clean this up and address the pre-inspection part of the problem. This is going to be effective as of the July 2021 version of the spec book. So moving forward, when a product is prefabricated from category one materials, if it is not pre-inspected, category one level documentation will be required. MDT reserves the right to determine which products will be pre-inspected. However, certain items will always be pre-inspected, mainly pre-stressed concrete products and prefabricated steel bridges and bridge members. More on that in a moment. The good news is this change only really applies to two products and it really only applies to one. Um, but the two products I'm talking about are overhead sign structures and bridge railing. These items are normally fabricated from structural steel, 
structural steel tubing or structural steel box beam guardrail. Um, however, since these items are not historically pre-inspected, they will require category one documentation by default. There is already a specific category one material code for overhead sign structures. So if you get a bid item for overhead sign structures, it comes with the material code for overhead sign structures indicating that it's category one. And the bridge item, or excuse me, the bid items for bridge railing already contain category one structural steel tubing. This is where there was a contradiction previously because these items were prefabricated but not pre-inspected. Pre-stressed beams are already category two since rebar and strand have been category two for a long time. This is another case where the steel checklist will make things easier by showing what material codes are attached to what bid items. In any case, the CERT must still contain the correct language. That's what we've gone through, melted and manufactured in the United States. And don't forget that this documentation still has to be delivered to the project with the Form 406. Never assume that because something was pre-inspected, it was pre-improved or excuse me, it was pre-approved or that the paperwork doesn't need to be submitted. Always submit the paperwork to the project. So to reiterate, items fabricated from category one materials that are not inspected at the point of fabrication must still provide category one documentation regardless if they are prefabricated moving forward. MDT reserves the right to determine which items will be pre-inspected and those items are Bridge beams or yeah, bridge beams and bridge members, they're always going to be inspected at the point of fabrication. Overhead steel structures may or may not be, and normally they are not inspected at the point of fabrication. Bridge rail is not usually inspected at the point of fabrication. And guardrail and piling are never inspected at the point of fabrication. So that wraps up prefabricated items. So now let's talk about precast items. For the purposes of this discussion, it's important to understand what is considered precast. If a concrete item is not cast in a precast plant that is either listed on the QPL or certified by a third party precast organization, it's considered cast in place. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a minute. MDT will either inspect the item or the facility to ensure documentation is being maintained. Precast items always require a Form 406, but will be accepted with Category 2 level documentation. All precast items are already considered Category 2 as documented in the Materials Manual. As we've discussed at length, the proper language must be included on the certifications, and the certification must cover the items indicated. So if it's a precast box or a pipe or drop inlet, or a beam, whatever it is, that has to be indicated on the CERT. And again, the documentation must come to the project with the Form 406. Stepping away from Buy America proper for just a moment here, the CERTs from a precast plant must also indicate the items meet the contract specifications. And here are some examples of acceptable language. If the contractor project is indicated, the language meets contract or project specifications is acceptable. Oftentimes, precast items are specific to contracts. And if you say this five by seven box culvert meets the specifications of this contract, that's acceptable. If it's an item that is covered by an AASHTO or ASTM standard, certifying it meets that standard is acceptable. As an example, if something says, or if a contract says needs to meet AASHTO XYZ, the CERT can say meets AASHTO XYZ, and you don't have to indicate the contract. And then finally, if the items identified, or excuse me, if the items are identified and they are obviously standard items like 24 inch concrete pipe, then simply stating meets MDT specifications is also acceptable because the specifications are always the same for a standard 24 inch concrete pipe. This would not be acceptable, however, for a project specific box culvert or pre-stressed beam. And as we discussed, MDT is in the precast plants monthly and annually, or at the time of construction to review other certifications and test results like cement certs or aggregate tests or strength tests. And 
because we're there and we're looking at this stuff periodically, that allows a more general level of certification. Now getting back to the cast in place discussion, when items are not made at plants that go through our inspection process, regardless if they are pre-cast, quote unquote, they are considered cast in place and must be inspected as such. So if you have one of these precast items on your project and it's made at a non-certified or non-listed plant, which isn't allowed in most situations, box culverts, um, pipe, uh, manholes, they all have to come from listed plants. But if you run into one of these situations, then the individual materials must be sampled and tested as if the items were cast and placed on the project. The classic example of this is barrier rail. These are routinely cast away from a listed plant and then transported to the project. So you could consider them precast, but we treat them as cast in place and the right documentation must be provided for the individual materials contained within. We also apply QA incentives to barrier rail and that complicates things. So we need to keep the materials separate. But if you wanna learn more about that, C sections 554 or 605 in the spec book. The last special situation is rebar. There is a construction memo out there right now with specific guidance on rebar that you can find at this link. And it covers a lot of what we've already talked about today, but I'll uh, go over the high points for you. So rebar is always category two. Uh, rebar must come from sources listed on the QPL as do epoxy coders. So whoever coats the rebar has to be listed on the QPL. These mills and epoxy coders go through annual third-party audits that include documentation review and random split sample tests. Rebar still requires a form 406. Um, mill certs and heat numbers are not required because they're category two. However, the name and location of the mill and or the epoxy coder must be shown on the certification so that we can verify that they're listed on the QPL. The size and specification of the rebar must also be indicated so we can verify the right product and the right spec has been furnished. So if it's a size number six bar, grade 60, all that stuff has to be documented. And finally, the correct domestic language must be included along with the name of the person making the certification. So if you have questions about rebar, go to that link. It's all explained in great detail there. So in conclusion, today we focused on Buy America. At one time, MDT tried to eliminate that reference due to all the confusion with the other domestic laws and the different interpretations out there that I've gone over today. But much like the imperial measurement system, it's never going away. So the goal here is to explain it as best we can. And remember material and quality specs must both be provided just because it's domestic doesn't mean it meets the spec. And here are just some examples of what I'm talking about. So when we talked about rebar, ASTM A615 is a standard spec, AASHTO M31, it has to meet that spec as well as being melted and manufactured in the United States. And that brings this presentation to a close. I hope this information is helpful to both MDT and contractor personnel. This presentation will be posted internally and externally for anyone to reference in the future. Hopefully there won't be too many changes, but there's always gonna be some changes, so updates will be made as appropriate. The intent is for this to serve as a single source of information that both the contracting community and MDT inspectors can reference. The PowerPoint slides will also be posted as a PDF file for anyone to download. Please feel free to contact any of us listed here if you have any questions. And thank you for your time and attention.